generally speaking, Professor, does the level of interest rate affect your decision to have more or less equity versus bonds? What I care about is the equity premium Okay. in this discussion. I care about if I can get 4% in the bond market, what I care about is how much extra do I get in the equity market? So if the bond market is 1%, presumably the equity premium stays roughly constant and the expected return on stocks goes down a bit from the 4% interest rate. If interest rates are at four, here's where they are. If interest rates drop, here's where they are. But pretty much they drop in tandem. How do we beat the markets? Is it even possible to consistently beat the markets over time? How do we measure risk versus reward? And importantly, how do we build the optimal portfolio for ourselves? These are the questions we'll be asking our next guest, who is not only an expert on asset pricing and valuations, but is perhaps one of the most influential figures in the world when it comes to financial research and economics. He is Kenneth French, currently the Roth Family Distinguished Professor of Finance at the Tuck Business School at Dartmouth. Uh, Professor French's work on asset pricing and expected returns and the multi-factor model that he's worked on with Eugene Fama has helped shape the fabric of finance over the last 30 years. First, a word from our sponsor, iTrust Capital. iTrust is an IRA that offers more than 30 crypto assets with the lowest trading fees in the crypto IRA space at 1%. It also offers unique tax benefits. So if you're over 18 and you want to open a new account with cash or row over an existing account, click on itrust.capital slash David in the link down below to get started to learn more. Uh, Professor French, it's an honor to finally meet you and speak with you. I've uh, studied your work in finance. Uh, your asset pricing models were required reading and study for pretty much every single finance student around the world. So thank you for being here. Well, I always apologize when somebody says they had to read my paper. So I'm sorry you suffered through that. Um, well, it wasn't it wasn't me. It was uh, it was my professors who had to assign our homework. But uh, you should, uh, if anything, you should apologize to them. I learned a lot, so no need to apologize to me. I want to start by asking you this question, and we'll continue to talk about your your work uh, that you've done, uh, actually with Eugene Fama as well, the multi factor uh, Fama French model. Can you beat the market, professor? Can you can one sustainably and consistently beat the market? Uh, without luck involved? Those were two different questions. The first one was easy. Okay. <laughs> Can I beat the market? Only on rare occasions. Sure. Can someone out there beat the market? I'm pretty confident there are people out there who, in my language, it's sort of they have true positive expected alpha. In other words, they're not going to win every quarter or every month. But in an expectational sense, they're doing better than average. So then given, let's talk about your research. Given what you found uh, through your many decades of researching this topic, is it worth it for someone to try to pursue beating the markets as a goal for their fund? Um, it's certainly, there's, the way you frame the question as a goal for their fund uh, is a challenge because the way I think about it is, when we look at the mutual funds, for example, all active equity mutual funds, um, it's hard to say that, in fact, there are people there who are delivering positive alpha after fees and expenses. Yes. That's different from saying there's nobody out there who is systematically beating the market. And what I mean by that is the performance of the manager is different from the performance of the fund. Funds pay expenses, they have fees. Managers collect parts of those fees. Managers can have superior returns before costs, before expenses, and leave nothing on the table for their investors. For me, that's actually a very critical distinction that I look at it and I say, okay, when I look at the data, it's really hard to say there are some managers out there who are systematically beating the market. When Tom and I did a study called Luck versus Skill in the Cross-Section of Mutual Funds, 
Yes. What we found was across the whole distribution, there's probably something around two or three percent of the fund managers who are able to cover their costs. Everybody else is not even able to cover their costs. That does not say, however, that there's nobody there who's systematically beating the market. And what, the, what I mean is there are some people who are contributing at least some of their fees in superior performance. So think in terms of before costs, they're beating the market. But after costs, what they're taking out, what they're paying their accountants, what they're charged paying the traders for them. After that, they're not making enough to cover those costs. And in equilibrium, that's exactly what we'd expect. What I'd really like to see is in equilibrium, investors break even. What it looks like to me is most investors in mutual funds appear to be happy to systematically lose money. What, what do you mean by happy to systematically lose money? Is that a hyperbole, Professor? No. The, ha the happy part may be, but I'm just saying what we see in the data right. is if you aggregate up all mutual funds into one big gargantuan portfolio, that portfolio looks like the market minus costs. So it's highly correlated with the return on the market, but there's a drawdown on that return and that is fees and expenses. Um, and that's what the data said over and over and over again. You, you referenced a paper you wrote with Eugene Fama called Luck Versus Skill in a Cross-Section of Mutual Fund Returns. Um, in the regressions and models and simulations that you used, how were you able to distinguish actual perform performance versus luck? Well, let's define luck. What does that mean, first and foremost? Luck is either good or bad luck. Yeah. Most of... What we observe in realized returns, what we'd like when we do forecasting is really powerful forecasts where our predictions are almost always spot on. In the stock market, there must be, if somebody's able to do that, I've never been able to see them. And what I mean by that is some people can make forecasts with some ability. Most of us can't hard, make hardly any, any, most of us have very little information about what's going to happen in securities markets. Mm -hmm. Look, we used to have a futures contract on ketchup. Okay. We don't have a contract on ketchup anymore. Why? Because I know what the price of ketchup is. It's two thirty nine dollars a bottle. There's no reason to bet about it. So what we do is we trade financial assets where it's really hard to forecast the future. Interesting. What that means is we have a little bit of information about what the realized return is going to be, but most of the realized return is unexpected. When we do research, when we do studies, when portfolio managers try to pick winners, they're trying to guess what that return is going to be. Their guess is their expectation. Their expectation, just like my expectation, has very little information about what's actually going to happen. Over reasonable horizons, the return is dominated by the unexpected. And the best example I have of that is COVID. If you stood there at the beginning of 2020 and tried to guess what was going to happen, Almost certainly you were going to be way off. Unless somehow or other you anticipated COVID, you're not going to get that one right. Okay. Uh, when COVID happened and the world shut down, there was a brief period shortly after, I believe, February, March 2020, when the markets, the S&P 500, crashed by, I believe, the order of almost 50%. It recovered shortly after, of course. Do you think markets accurately priced in the information that we had about the situation happening in the world? Yeah. The market did its best based on the information it had. Think about it. 
I mean, you don't think you don't. So you don't believe they re overreacted. Based on the, I have no way to decide whether, in fact, we overreacted given the information that was available. Mm -hmm. What I know was, in real time, my wife and I were wiping down everything that came into the house. Yeah, and we look at that now and laugh at ourselves. How crazy was that? It wasn't crazy at the time. Based on the best information we had. Look, you know, we were 66, 67 years old at the time. It was our generation that was getting wiped out. We didn't know whether we were superheroes who could suffer COVID and survive it. So we were not taking any chances. And we said, hmm, we don't know really what's how this is being communicated. Mm -hmm. Let's assume the worst. The okay. market presumably was doing the same thing. It was taking its best shot. Very little information about what was going to transpire. And so the volatility went through the roof. Why? Because every little piece of information was projected over many years saying, oh, this is what the future is going to look like. And then you got a little bit more. Whoa, totally changed your forecast of the future. A little more went the other way this time. And it's people searching, trying to understand the future when there's really very little information. That's in general what happens in financial markets. And if it's not, we don't bother trading. There's not all that randomness. We don't bother trading. Uh, I like to, well, that was a good introduction to your work. So I like to talk about uh, first portfolio allocation, and then we'll talk about asset pricing in a bit more detail uh, later on. Throughout 2022, the 60-40 portfolio um, allocation between equities and 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 bonds uh, did poorly for most people as both asset classes fell, as you know. So people are wondering whether or not that's still a viable strategy going forward. How would you decide uh, how much to allocate to either bonds or equities or any other asset class? Um, <laughs> this is sort of an embarrassing answer okay. for a financial economist, because I'm going to sound very much like a behavioralist. All right. Which I suppose I shouldn't be embarrassed by. I mean, I'm human. So I basically, when I think in terms of how much stock do I want in my portfolio relative to how much bond, bonds I want, I sort of take an approach to minimize my regret. So on a day when the market goes up a lot, I'm sorry I didn't have more stock. On a day when the market goes down a lot, I'm sorry I had so much stock. My approach is to find the point at which the regret on days when it goes down about offsets the regret on days when it goes up. And, you know, I'm a finance guy, so I try to wait the days with the right frequency. But in essence, what I'm doing here is saying, let me find a strategy that is easiest for me to live with. I can live with that strategy. I'm not going to be churning my portfolio. This is probably a pretty good way to go. And I have the advantage that the market's protecting me from being wrong. What do I mean by that? Well, I know the expected return on stocks is higher than the expected return on bonds. Okay. I also know the risk associated with stocks is higher than the risk associated with bonds. Okay. So let's say my optimal strategy is 57% equity, and I overshoot. I have 65%. Bad news, I have too much risk. That's offset, not fully. Otherwise, I would have said 65 is the right answer. But that's offset by higher expected returns on stocks. So it's not just, oh, I suffer the extra volatility of the 8%. Yeah, I suffer, but I benefit by an extra expected return because of that 8%. And if it happens I have under allocated to equity, it's the reverse. Mm -hmm. I have less risk. I have to pay for that with a lower expected return on my portfolio. So the market's kind of helping me by saying, I mean, here's the way I think about it. If I thought of my objective function as a hill, and I'm trying to be at the top of the hill, the slope at the top of the hill is zero. So being off when you're at the top of the hill, 
that's not so bad because it doesn't cost you much to go to the left. Right. It doesn't cost you much to go to the right. And the market's doing that. It's basically saying, hey, you're optimum. We're going to make it flat for you. The, uh, now, I'm not going to ask you to forecast interest rates, but generally speaking, Professor, does the level of interest rate affect your decision to have more or less equity versus bonds? Suppose the interest rate were lower, for example, the cost of capital would be lower. Does that not you know, give some more weight to certain asset classes than others? What I care about is the equity premium Okay. in this discussion. I care about if I can get 4% in the bond market, what I care about is how much extra do I get in the equity market? So if the bond market is 1%, presumably the equity premium stays roughly constant and the expected return on stocks goes down a bit from the 4% interest rate. If interest rates are at four, here's where they are. I gotta get in the picture here. If interest rates drop, here's where they are. But pretty much they drop in tandem. So okay. I, it's not going to change my allocation or the ideal allocation very much. What, what is your, what is your um, view on modern portfolio theory, the Markowitz optimization theory? Does that work? Have you, have you observed that in real life? When you say optimization theory, I presume what you mean is, am I trying to maximize your sharp ratio? Is, uh, is that, yes, yes, the uh, the 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 highest. Well, yes, yes, the, the highest, highest expected return, return with the lowest volatility. So yes, the highest sharp ratio. You're correct. Yes. Yeah. So the highest equity premium or risk premium in the portfolio relative to the variance. That right. presumes that I think of variance as risk. So what you'd like is the expected premium per unit of risk. Maximize mm -hmm. that. But then we'd have to say, well. Risk is variance if sharp ratio is what matters. I don't think the variance of my portfolio, my investment portfolio, is the right way to think about risk. What I worry about is uncertainty about my lifetime consumption, broadly defined. So I'm saving because I want to spend in the future, spend in a broad sense. So yes, I want to eat, I want to buy cars, I also want to give money to charities. I want to mm -hmm. give money to my kids. There's all sorts of things I want to do with my money. Okay. And so what I care about is how volatile is that stream of cash flows available to me to spend right. going to be in the future? And if I, if I have a portfolio, if I'm constrained to things that are totally unrelated to my future consumption, then you're right, variance is the right way to think about it. But suppose what I could do is buy a portfolio that insulates me from uncertainty about consumption. And most of us do that. Think about buying our house. If I buy a house and I plan to live in it until I die, what I've done is I've said, okay, let me lock up a package of consumption that I know I'm going to want. The consumption flows from my house. I buy it today. It's mine until I die with no answer. So that's what I mean. It, they, I always point to the folks at Enron as the people who didn't get this at all. Much of senior management had all of their retirement wealth tied up in Enron stock. Mm -hmm. So the day Enron fails, they lost. also lost all their savings. That's the opposite of the way I would like to approach it. I want to look at my portfolio and say, what can I do with my portfolio to manage the aggregate risk of my lifetime consumption? Okay, so for somebody watching this who is perhaps a retail investor who would want to manage his own portfolio, his or her, her own portfolio, and he wants to ask himself, how do I manage my lifetime consumption? Because you, you have a very interesting way of defining risk, which you just said, which is uncertainty about lifetime consumption. What are the critical questions that he or she needs to be asking themselves to gauge their level of risk tolerance? On the one hand, you could buy treasuries and hold that for life. On the one hand, you can buy some cryptocurrency that could make you very rich or very poor the next day. You don't know. Somewhere in the, between that spectrum, how would you decide your own level of risk tolerance? 
again, I'll point out, you're talking in terms of variance. Okay. Variance of the investment portfolio. And my point is, that's the wrong way to think about it. The right way to think about it is how much uncertainty about their lifetime consumption are they willing to trade off to get higher expected future cash flows? That's the right question. And so the, when I talk to folks about this, I start by saying, okay, one of the things we can be absolutely confident of is if I add up all the investors in the world, mm -hmm. all of their portfolios, put them in one huge bucket, what am I looking at? I'm looking at the valuate market portfolio. And when I say market here, I don't mean just stocks. I mean, all financial instruments are in positive net supply. So just add up all the financial investments anybody in the world makes, that's going to be a valuate market portfolio. I think to a first approximation, that aggregate portfolio is probably priced pretty well. So if I say to myself, for the aggregate of all the investors out there, that portfolio is priced pretty well. What that says to me is, if I looked like the average across all of the investors out there, the average, we're going to weight all, you know, the largest or wealthiest people, they get the most weight in that average. Mm -hmm. For folks like myself, we don't get very much weight in that average. But I just say, okay, how do I personally look relative to the value weight average of every one of us? If I assume that the value weight portfolio is a reasonable portfolio for that value weight average investor, then all I have to do is ask, how do I differ from that value weight average investor? And if I say, okay, well, I'm probably, well, let's start with the fact that I'm an American. Most of what I consume is in dollars. So for me, if I have more money invested in dollars than the value weight average of all people, a bunch of people outside the U.S., that's probably a good strategy for me. Why? Because it manages my inflation risk. It manages the risk of what's going to happen in the economy I care most about. That's a good way to go, deviating from the value weight average of everybody. And again, I think to go back to your way of thinking about it, I'm probably less risk averse mm -hmm. than most people out there. I don't know why. I just... Not that scared of stuff these days. So if I'm less risk averse than the value weight average, then I probably want to tilt my portfolio towards scarier things where I assume there's a higher risk premium associated. So I do that. I tend to have more equity in my portfolio than the typical 69 year. That's how I approach this problem. I say, how do I look? All right. relative to the value weight average of all investors. When deciding whether or not a particular security has a higher risk profile than something else, the traditional approach is to maybe look at past returns, past variances, past standard deviations. Is that the correct approach? It assumes that past returns are indicative of future returns. That's right. There, I spoke earlier about the fact that most of realized returns right. are unexpected. Yes, what that means is it's hard as heck to figure out what the expected was, even if I get to look backward at the data. Imagine what I've done now is I've said, okay, I have five years of returns on this stock, and I'm going to look at its five-year performance. Almost all of that five-year performance on a stock is going to be unexpected. You're trying to forecast the expected. You're trying to look at the past to infer that expected. Most of what you're looking at is unexpected. If I start aggregating up, so I get some diversification of the unexpected, there's some correlations in the expected, mm -hmm. but there's also going to be a lot of idiosyncratic variation. So I'm more informed when I think about a portfolio. But even if I think about a portfolio, 
This task of identifying the expected return is incredibly hard. So let me give you my favorite example of this. Okay. Suppose everybody else in the world believes the equity risk premium, the expected return of stocks relative to the expected return on short-term bonds is 8% a year. God comes down and tells me it's six. How long will it take me to get the standard measure of what we think of as outside the standard of error? Like if I were doing polling data and they say outside the standard of error. If you're a statistician, you think T statistic bigger than two. <laughs> How many years would it take on average to get a T statistic bigger than two? I know the answer because we talked about this offline, so I'm not going to spoil it. I want you to give the answer. It, it may surprise some people. What did you find? The answer is 400 years. <laughs> okay. And when you say fine, this is actually a baby statistics question. What I've done is I've said, okay, let's assume the volatility on the equity risk premium is 20%. And that's about right. And that is almost exactly the volatility of the U.S. equity premium. If I take equity premiums around the world, I get a bit of diversification, but not that much. It's still going to be awfully darn close to 20%. And then I said, okay, I'm looking when I think it's eight, the truth is six. So I want to be able to tell that I'm too high. I want to be able to reject eight as the right answer. In other words, I want a T statistic that's actually more negative than minus two. What's the real life implication of this finding here? This what the real life implication is, most of us have no sense of how imprecise our forecasts of the future are. The only reason I can understand when I look at the level of volume in the stock market, for example, yeah, it's just gross overconfidence. I think I know more than you do, and you think I know more than I do, and so we trade. Both of us are grossly overconfident, and if we had any sense at all about how imprecise our forecasts are, we'd have more respect for the other guy, and we wouldn't put the trade on. Uh, okay, uh, two follow-up questions to this. So first of all, uh, the notion that the past is all we have. I mean, how would you respond to the adage that history doesn't repeat itself all the time, but it rhymes? And so, you know, with what what else do we have to predict the future if not just past data? That you have models. Models to me, models are ways to make sense of the world that integrates everything I know about them. If you say, what do I think the equity premium is? Which is a great question. I mean, to a financial economist, that's like the the speed of light or the co coefficient of gravity or, you know, it's like the fundamental number. If an economist could pick one number to say, I know this one, that would be the one that would be really nice, the equity risk premium. And what I've just shown you is it's incredibly hard to do that. So to answer your question, I have to know what much more precisely what question you'd like me to answer. How do I use the past to predict the future? It depends on what I'm trying to predict. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I say, this one's just not knowable. The, the, the 400 years that you've arrived, would, would it be possible to shrink that number down? Suppose we were to gather information uh, more efficiently, we're gathering more information with the help of technology. Suppose I were to integrate AI. Could I be able to process? Oh, that's a heck of a great question. Yeah. Give me a hint how you might even think about using AI to estimate the equity risk premium. I would have to expand uh, the breadth of my model to many, many, many variables, and it would have to be it would be beyond the scope of my manual calculation. The AI would have to do it for me, or. Yeah, but the AI, the only information in the end that the AI is going to have is what the premium has been in the past. So it needs to calibrate itself, right? So we could have a model that says people are overconfident, people trade too much, 
people get uh, too excited about what happened in the past, but then what would it do with that information? The only thing it could do is say, okay, I got to calibrate. In the past, when this has happened, this is what we've observed. And in the past, when that's happened, that's what we've observed. And maybe the AI would observe a really meaningful pattern and be able to say, I think the equity premium is lower than typical right now because of these patterns that's it identified. Mm -hmm. But the absolute level would be an incredibly challenging thing because you've got to calibrate somehow. So if, if the AI could somehow or other go to look in loggers and the deep sea fishermen and people who do really dangerous jobs and say, this is the level of risk aversion people have. They demand an extra $10,000 a year to take this level of risk. Maybe that would help inform the answer to your question. But it would be a big leap to say the loggers that are out there risking their lives cutting down trees, it is one of the most dangerous professions. They're the right measure of risk aversion to figure out what the typical investor wants when thinking about his or her portfolio. Yeah, My I, guess is the loggers aren't typical. That's why they're willing to go take those risks. But failing, you know, not having any other information, maybe that's the right way to go. It, it Well, okay. So this is kind of a blue sky kind of thinking question. If you had a supercomputer that you could do use to do anything with, uh, what information would you like it to farm that could give you a competitive edge over every single other farm uh, fund manager in the world? <laughs> Man, that's not a game I play at all. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's sort of, in, in some sense, that's been my career. Right. I, I, my, my problem is not lack of computing power, at least mechanical computing power. Right. I mean, I, I essentially have been able to answer, run every regression I've ever thought of running. It's the problem is, OK, what information is actually going to help me answer that question? you asked? I wouldn't know where to start. I mean, it's sort of I, I don't make any. Suppose claims. you had unlimited data sets in a supercomputer to run through every single data set in the universe. Would it not be able to use regressions to calculate the variables that had the strongest impact on whatever security you're looking at? No. No? It would be able to tell me is during the sample period that I've looked, what was most correlated with the realized return? Right. Okay. And let me emphasize, most of that realized return is unexpected. It gets better and better if I take longer and longer horizons. That's why 400 years is long enough to tell eight is too high relative to six. But it takes 400 years to do that, at least to get the standard level of confidence. I, I think this is a good segue to talk about your work on the uh, multi-factor models. Um, how the, the <laughs> issue of how to I calculate- I think you're abandoning this this line of questioning. <laughs> I know, we, we, can't, we can't forgo what, well, arguably what you're most famous for, at least in the textbooks. First of all, uh, before we get into the models themselves, do you have any notion as to why the Fama French multi-factor models made it into every finance textbook that I've been instructed to read, including the CFA programs, um, including economics textbooks as well. How did that happen? Um, I think we happened to, um, we had, we were blessed with two pieces of good luck. One, um, we thought about writing that paper at the right time. In other words, the, the paper we actually got lucky with was a paper called The Cross-Section of Expected Returns. We built the three-factor model on the results of that paper. But all we did in that paper was put together a bunch of results that other people had. So like even the value effect, which people often associate with us, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, well, Warren Buffett had been trading on the value effect for a long time before we came along. 
So, you know, it's Graham and Dodd that talk about value in exactly the same way, um, well, well before we came along. So what we did in that paper was consolidate, sort of um, make the results more systematic, just line them up so it was easier for people to see. And then second, we probably wrote more clearly than some other people had written. Mm -hmm. and, and you put those two together and it carried the day. So it, was, it wasn't that we had some phenomenally deep insight. The insight was in the three-factor model. Um, I do think we did have an insight there. At the time that we wrote the three-factor model, people before us had tried to create factor models so with varying levels of success. And what they had typically done was start with how stocks are related, their covariances. They were looking for the common factors that drove returns. So what they did is they focused on the patterns in the covariances and then asked whether those patterns ended up related to differences in the realized returns on the stocks and bonds, whatever they were looking at. We reversed it. We said, we've got these patterns we've observed in stock returns. Mm -hmm. Let's build factors that line up with those patterns. So small stocks tended to have higher average returns than big stocks. So let's make a factor that emphasizes that. And it became small minus big. Let's take the return on small stocks minus the return on big stocks. That's going to be our size factor. Value versus growth. We called it high because we were using book to market to measure things. High book to market minus low book to market. That's our value measure. And then we said, okay, as long as there are systematic relations among value stocks, they tend to move together. And growth stocks, they tend to move together. If I regress value stocks on value minus growth, I should get a big positive coefficient. If I regress growth stocks on value minus growth, growth is minus there, so I should get a negative coefficient. And sure enough, that's what we see. And it's those patterns, the ones that line up positively, oh, those are the ones with a higher expected return predicted by the model. And I already knew they were the ones that had a higher average return. So the model worked, but it worked because we almost cheated. Oh, let, let, let's just back up for just a minute here. Sure. So the, 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 your work expands on the CAPM model, right? The capital asset price. And we added model. two more factors. At That's what right. point? So let's just explain to the audience the CAPM um, gives the expected return uh, using really just one factor, beta. Uh, at, at what point did you re beta is 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 the uh, how much a particular security moves? Yeah, the, in the factor to the in the cap M, The yeah. factor in the cap M is the return on the market minus the risk free rate. Okay. The sensitivity to the factor that's beta. Okay. Yes. Yes. So that, thank you for clarifying. At what point did you realize the uh, that that one factor wasn't enough, and you needed to add more factors to explain the model more well, more precisely? We well, got. A size, a strong size effect at the time, a strong value effect at the time, and neither one of them was explained by the gap M. So that says, hey, we need a better model. Okay. That's all it was. And then did you just experiment with different things until you arrived at- No, we, uh, we, your th literally, on, we literally only did one. <laughs> okay. I mean, we, what we did do we knew what we knew the idea. We had this idea that all we got to do is put together value stocks minus growth stocks, small stocks minus big stocks. And you can see if I regress small value stock, and let's make it, yeah, small value stocks mm -hmm. against small minus big and value minus growth. Yes. What I'm going to get are positive coefficients on both factors. So 
that's going to say, okay, this portfolio ought to have a high expected return. I said, okay, if I sort on size, small minus big, yes, value minus growth, and regress a portfolio of small value stocks on that, I'm going to get positive coefficients on both factors. And so the model is going to say, oh, that portfolio ought to have a high expected return because it's loading positively on both of these positive expected return factors. And sure enough, it does. But it's like baked in mm -hmm. by our approach. The critical question then is, is that relation essentially linear? That's what a factor model is about. So what people had done in the past was they said, let's do those covariances, decompose them, do they explain the patterns. It's much easier to start with the patterns and ask, can we explain the covariances? Well, essentially, we can relate them to the covariances. And then the only real question is, is it linear with those covariances? The short answer is, even in the first paper, we rejected linearity, but it's pretty good. We just had enough power that we could say it's not perfect. Uh, since the 90s, since the paper came out, how would you say your work uh, changed the fund management industry? I was a PhD student in the 80s, and Lipper was the firm that provided most of the mutual fund data back then. Their classifications, they were almost meaningless. They had growth, growth and income, uh, long-term value, all, all sorts of things that if I gave you the names, you would not be able to link them up to the portfolios unless they told you this is the long-term value portfolio. And this is the growth and income portfolio. It was sort of the industry was ripe for a different way to categorize things. So people saw the size effect, people saw the value effect and said, hey, that's a really useful way. When we think about divvying up our portfolio, let's think in the terms of size and value versus growth. And it, so it, it really transformed the way institutions, financial advisors, lots of people who are trying to form portfolios, how they think about organizing their stocks and bonds, mostly their stocks. Yes. So I, I was, I, I'm curious, Professor, why in the formula for the multi-factor and the, well, let's start with the three-factor model first. Did you not assign weighting to the variables? Uh, you assume that all variables are equally important to the expected return? Um, we don't assume all variables are equally important. So there's the freedom we have is in designing the portfolio. Okay. Like SMB. And it was clear to us what we wanted to do. Now we do want to maximize the sharp ratio. We'd like to get the most information about the expected return relative to the level of volatility. In other words, we wanted a big spread between the premium on value or the expected return on value and the expected return on growth. We could do that by just having one stock at one end and one stock at the other end. The trouble there is the denominator is going to kill you there's going to be huge volatility. It's the signal relative to the noise that you care about. And the noise in this case really is the variance. The signal, that's the spread in the expected returns. Yes. And the noise, that's the volatility of that premium. If I were to run uh, a model using this formula, the three-factor model, would there be a minimum number of securities I have to include in my models to make it make sense? You mean the, on the left-hand side or the right-hand side? The, the, so the models themselves small, are small comp, small comp, small versus big, for example. Um, let me ask you. Let me see if I can reframe your question. Sure. Does it make a lot of sense 
for a company uh, to take five years of its past returns, regress those against the three or the five or the six factor model and say, this is the firm's cost of equity to the 0.001%. No, that's absolutely silly. Mm -hmm. Why? Because there's so much noise here. To the extent that you can diversify, if you were thinking about a portfolio, for example, you can eliminate a lot of that randomness and you get more precision in what your statement is. But to say, you know, I want to measure this company's cost of capital, yet let's use the three-factor model. Well, yeah, okay, fine. As long as you give me 80 years and your company hasn't changed, then we may be able to say something. Well, I'm sorry. overstating it, but, uh, but you, not by much. You, you're saying newer companies can't, younger companies, this won't apply to them. Even older companies, if they change, it will okay. apply to them. It'll just be really, really noisy. It's like asking, how much do I weigh? Mm -hmm. And you take me over to a trucking scale. Right? I mean, okay. you know, the, the, the scales on the side of the highway that weigh trucks? Yeah. You're not going to get a very precise measure with me. I understand. Um, well, and there that's... is information, but it's just not very, very useful information. In the same way, if you want me to estimate your company's cost to capital, I'm probably not using the three factor model. Do you, do you think companies are estimating their own cost of capital? correctly across the board right now um i i, I... correctly is a raw is not the right word are they putting too much weight on their estimate of the cost of capital probably it's it's not that precise even if you give me the best model it's not going to be that precise i, I remember when i studied um modeling courses for investment banking we had to use the CAPM as an input for the cost of capital for every single company that we were assigned to look at. Um, this is what people do, Professor. This is uh, this is what the industry does um, when assigning- It doesn't make it right. <laughs> Before Billy Ball, we had scouts out there studying things without a clue what they were thinking about. In the same way, if you asked me, I can use the CAPM to estimate a company's cost of capital, cost of equity, or I can use 11%. Mm -hmm. I'm taking 11%. Why? Because when I plot historically the relation between average returns and beta, it's pretty flat. Right. Putting an upward sloping line over it is worse than just having a horizontal line. So your your manager can demand that you do that, and if you, you know, if you want to get paid, you'll do that. That it, doesn't make it right. Generally speaking, is there a relationship, a consistent relationship between the level of the cost of capital and the asset price itself? So Absolutely. stock price. What what is this That's relationship? I just don't know what the cost of capital is. So the the can I can I make can I make this generalization, Professor? The higher the cost of capital, the, the lower the stock price. Holding cash flow is fixed, absolutely. Those are two sides of the same coin. Okay. Right? The current stock price is the expected cash flow discounted back at the long run expected return. On this note, how would you value? We talked about this the other day. How would you value something that doesn't have cash flow? How would you value a commodity, for example? Let's stick with stocks for a moment because okay. commodities gets well. Let me let me give you the simple answer on commodities. Okay. Take a case where you can't store the commodity. The current value of that commodity is the price that clears the spot market. That's it. Nothing more. That is the value. To an economist, demand equals supply, markets clear. That's the value of that commodity. If I allow storage, 
and I have a forecast of what prices will be next year, then that puts a cap on what the price can be because I could say, well, if the price goes above this, I'm just going to take supply off the market and store it until next year. Okay, so there's that little wrinkle with storage. Without storage, mm -hmm. like for a while, we had so much oil being stored, they ran out of tankers. At that point, I know we're just going to clear the market every day. And they're, you know, accusing people of manipulating the market. Yeah. How the heck do you manipulate if you've got all the storage in the world tied up with all the oil that's sitting out there offshore and wherever else they were storing? So every day the market was just clearing. If I think about a company that doesn't have any cash flow, it's the same concept now. It's like that market clears because people anticipate cash flow in the future. And everybody's making forecasts of what those cash flows are going to be. And then says, okay, what's the present value of those future expected cash flows? And the expected return on the stock, to the, to the extent that those forecasts of the cash flow are rational, mm -hmm. then the thing that links the price today to those future expected cash flows that's the rational expected return. And you can change any one of those three. You can change cash flows, you can change discount rates, and you can change price. Mm -hmm. You change one, one or both of the other ones have to change too. Okay, makes sense. Um, I'd like to close off on, on risk assessment one more time, going back to risk. Um, we've been taught throughout our finance schooling that diversification is one of the ways to mitigate risk. Let, let me ask you, Professor, what is or what should be the correct thought process to determine how diversified one should be? If I were an, an individual investor and I want to own a portfolio of stocks, the first question that I have, and I have this conversation with my friends all the time, is how many stocks I should own? How do I go about answering that question? The, the question is a hard one because there's a lot of different parameters. Okay. Let me give you one easy example that frames it the way I would frame it. Okay. Which is, do I want to buy a portfolio of houses or do I want to buy my own house? I have, I can go out and buy one hundredth of a hundred different houses or I can buy my own house. If I'm planning to live in my own house forever till I die, which way do I want to go? For me, it's an obvious answer. I want to buy my own house. Why? Because now I've eliminated the uncertainty about that whole stream of consumption. I don't have to worry about it. So now let's go to the question you really asked, mm -hmm. which is you're thinking about a stock portfolio. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the cost of diversifying more? If you're simply going to go out and buy different stocks, you're going to have all sorts of extra transactions costs as you add more stocks. You're going to have monitoring costs. You're going to have governance costs. There's all sorts of costs associated with getting a more and more diversified portfolio. And then if you also believe you have information about the market, you have a positive alpha with respect to some of your stocks. This is a point Charlie Munger made, which is, as you diversify, you sacrifice some of that alpha on the stocks that you think you have alpha. The difference between me and Charlie Munger, Charlie really did have alpha on stocks. Me, I don't even pretend I have alpha. I think you're being humble. But yes, I, I understand your point. So it's, you know, if you say how many stocks, I need to know a lot about what your costs look like, what your alphas look like. On the other hand, if you say, all right, how much do I gain from the 101st relative to the 100th? Right. As long as it's not 100 railroads, and now we're talking about one consumer product company, you know, if it's stocks you picked at random, right. the 101st isn't going to do much for you. L let me ask you a slightly 
different question. Well, maybe the same question, different way. Wh which is a more difficult task for you, Professor? Estimating um, micro risk, like individual company risk, or estimating systemic risk in the in, in the broad markets? When you say risk, I, again, I struggle with the word risk. Okay, I, I, I would say a, totally. A, you're not a, clear to me. I, it's not clear to me what you mean when you say risk. Maybe I'll use a textbook definition, which is just uncertainty about future returns. So just variance. I, I suppose so. Yes. <laughs> okay. So now that I understand what you're, wait. So your question is, would I rather guess the uncertainty about? One, one individual one individual stock or yes systematic risk for the entire market i i get diversification if okay. you allow me to combine individual stocks what do i what does it diversify to it diversifies to the systematic so there's no way for me to manage the systematic risk i can push it off to somebody else but in the end and as a group, we're going to bear right. the systematic risk. We don't have to bear idiosyncratic risk. We can diversify away the part that's unrelated to the other stocks. Somebody's going to bear the systematic risk. I have one final question for you, Professor. This has been a fantastic talk. Thank you very much. Um, a Thank college you. student comes to you and ask you for career advice. He says, I want to go into the finance industry. Specifically, I want to be a fund manager one day. And I don't want the, you know, I want to beat the markets. I want to be, you know, I want to generate alpha, whatever that means. You know, what's my, what's my, what's my optimal, what's the best career path I should embark in? He's he's first day, first year taking one of your econ classes. First, I wouldn't try to dissuade them. Okay. Because Dartmouth has an option on his future. And what we like is when students go out and take high volatile, highly volatile uh, careers. Yeah. What do I mean by that? Suppose he shoots the light at, lights out, becomes a billionaire. You know who's going to be knocking on his door first. It's going to be the development office from Dartmouth. Okay. On the other hand, suppose... He fails miserably. He's not going to get a call from Dartmouth offering to refund his, his tuition. So to the extent that Dartmouth has that, owns the up part of the upside and none of the downside, variance is a wonderful thing. <laughs> um, now, if I were really trying to be kind and say, what's the best way for you to go? Um, what you'd like is to appreciate analytical skill. It's surely going to require really understanding the world deeply. You're going to have to find an edge that nobody else, or at least very few other people have. My favorite example of that is one that involves me. Brad Cornell and I, just before they came out with Stock Index Futures, had written a couple of papers on how you price stock index futures. When they started trading, we were surprised to discover the prices were wrong. They weren't lining up the way they should have. And so we put together a little partnership and we started trading, doing index arbitrage. And we made a killing, at least relative to our income. We made a lot of money. We never lost money. It really was an arbitrage. But after about three months, the prices had converged and it wasn't worth our time anymore. And as I learned later, it was essentially Bear Stearns had figured out how to do index arbitrage. And they were just way more efficient at it mm -hmm. than Brad and I. Were. So we couldn't compete against them. They had a lot more money behind them too. Um, but the point of the story is, I'm not saying nobody can do this. I'm saying it takes a real edge. And if you want to do it for your own career, the edge better be a lot better than we know how to price stock index futures. Okay. It's got to be something deep, way deeper than anything I understand. You, you, well, you've had the opportunity to interact with and work with some exceptional fund managers in your career. 
just on a qualitative aspect, how are they different? What makes their instinct instinct more correct consistently than somebody else? Um, these are not any of my friends. To be okay. Clear. Okay. But I'm I'm aware of one and perhaps a few others who systematically use inside information. Okay. That that's not a good thing. Okay, be absolutely clear. The the folks who do it the honest way are challenged every day to think independently, find patterns that other people haven't found. Um, even folks who, who are using patterns that we know about, that other, the rest of the world knows about, they are... They have a bunch of skills. One skill is to figure out an edge relative to the way other people do it. Sometimes the edge is real. Sometimes the edge just happened to pop up in the data. Mm -hmm. But again, it's that confusion of expected versus unexpected. And then on top of that, they have to be able to manage a firm well, and they have to be able to sell well. So that whole combination is, is important. Um, mm -hmm. and it's to, to beat the market is incredibly hard. Uh, I happen to be involved with a firm that isn't trying to beat the market, mm -hmm. but rather just provide a service to the market and get paid for doing it. So that's kind of, uh, that's, that's my more simplistic approach to the world, but I'm not arguing that there aren't folks out there who can systematically beat the market. I understand. Career. All right. Well, Professor, thank you very much. Where can we learn more about you, your work, and um, and and uh, maybe perhaps some of the papers you've written? I always encourage people to go to SSRN.com. Okay. That's Social Science Research Network, SSRN.com. And it's you will find my work on there, but you'll find just about everybody's work on there. Yes. And if you're interested in anything at all, that's an easiest, the easiest place to find. All right. We'll put a link down below and I'll link a few of your papers that are in the public domain so people can check that out. Thank you very much, Professor French. Great Thank honor you, to have finally met you. Put a face to the name of, you know, chapter 10 of every single finance book I've read in my life. So thank you for being here. <laughs> thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. Uh, and thank you for watching. To the audience, thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, like this video and follow Professor French in the links down below.